big story in science this week. West Australian scientists have announced today that they've found fossilised stromatolites, the oldest life on the planet. Lee Dayton was there when this discovery was revealed to the world. This landscape has withstood the ravages of time. Its rocks are amongst the oldest on Earth. But its most precious secret has only recently been discovered, and now a race is on to prevent the ultimate case of vandalism, or at least to do it properly. And this is what's caused the excitement. They may look humble, but these bumpy brown egg cartons may be the fossilized traces of the oldest life on Earth. If so, they're scientifically priceless. Trouble is, they may also be worth cold, hard cash on the international fossil market. And that means they're a tempting target for unscrupulous collectors. So like reluctant vandals, scientists have come to the Pilbara to cut the precious fossils from the rock and take them back to Perth for safekeeping. But before the rocks are removed from their natural habitat, the world's leading experts are scouring the countryside. It's just my feeling is that it's thicker at the crest than it is on the flanks, and I don't see how that could be well. pushed up. They've come to decide whether or not the fossils really are as billed, ancient stromatolites. Living stromatolites can still be seen today in the warm, shallow waters of Shark Bay. Layers of microbes and sediment have gradually built up, forming these distinctive structures. These are up to 3,000 years old. But for this early life crowd, the possibility of finding three and a half billion year old fossil stromatolites is a very big deal indeed. I think this is just tremendous. I mean, this is, I think, the best place in the world to look for early life. I'm extremely excited. I think this is a, a dream trip for most of us interested in early bias for evolution. This is where a lot of the record is. This type of environment may well have been represented on Mars four billion years ago, and so I'm extremely excited to see what we're gonna be looking at today. And we've been uh, working up to this today. We've been seeing the, the preliminaries up to now, and this is the big event. This expedition to the middle of nowhere is about to make or break a scientific reputation. Kath Gray boasts a brand new doctorate in paleontology. With a Canadian colleague, she's claiming that the fossils are the best preserved evidence that microbe-sized life flourished on terra firma 3.5 billion years ago. It's going to be quite embarrassing to uh, stand there and listen to the comments, but uh, I think we've probably got the most convincing evidence that's been seen to date, and really we'll be quite proud to show it off. To Kath's relief, at least one part of the argument has already been settled. Her rocks are genuinely ancient. Geological survey scientists in Perth set their age to 3.46 billion years. But are these really fossils or just funny-shaped rocks? The international experts remain skeptical, and they're prepared to rip any weak evidence to shreds. You're shaking. Oh, I'm a bit worried about it. <laughs> Hans Hoffman and I work on the shape of the structures, and we're fairly convinced from that evidence, but everybody else has their own expertise, and they want to try and get the save their own evidence to, uh, to show it. It's all circumstantial. <laughs> and you can actually see them all the way through these bedding planes here, see two or three of the cones poking up. 
check when you finish that. Well, no, obviously good. everybody's showing interest, but there must be something of interest here. <laughs> You're such a persuasive person, Hans. <laughs> well, I like to have the rocks speak for themselves without an interpreter. You all have your own minds anyhow. No. <laughs> you figured that one out, huh? <laughs> so what were the rocks saying? Kath's mentor, Professor Malcolm Walter's first call is that they are indeed biogenic, that is, made by ancient microbes. It would be very difficult to understand how it could have formed by any mechanism other than a biological one, I think. But I've become very cautious over the years in interpreting these things. It's very easy to make a mistake. I would call them probable stomatolites. According to Stan Aramik, Kath's conical fossils resemble the shapes made by modern stromatolite building microbes. And their uniform alignment suggests they were formed within flowing water, one cone hiding behind the other to keep out of tidal currents. We don't yet know of any non-biological process that can produce the cones. We know biological processes Microbes in Yellowstone National Park are producing cones. And there's a rich record of conical stromatolites, some with microfossils in younger rocks. So we use all that experience and bring it to bear here. Then maybe someone will come out saying, ah, I've got a, a totally physical or a chemical way of producing cones. And that's how science works. <laughs> dangerously close to the precious surface here. Ex-NASA man, Professor Jack Farmer, concurs with Malcolm and Stan's caution. But there are other things that need to be, you know, sort of added to the story here, and I think all of us are sort of sitting on the fence to wait and see, well, what other evidence can we come up with that would help us sort of get off the fence, so to speak? It's, it's this exquisitely preserved surface isn't enough to dispel all doubts. It doesn't reveal how the structure was formed. Could it have resulted from weathering or even chemical reactions? Stromatolites form when sediments stick to tiny strand-like microbes. As the microbes grow toward the light, they leave behind distinctive rocky layers. Finding these sorts of growth patterns could sway the skeptics. And guess what? That's exactly what lay amidst the spin effects, just a few meters further up the hill. This is a really exciting surface, and the reason it's really exciting is because we see them very clearly in cross-section here, which we don't see elsewhere. Well, here, for example, we have one that starts out as a very sharp cone. We follow the center of the cone up. We see it becomes a dome, and then it becomes a cone again, and then it becomes a cone again, and finally disappears. So what you've had at any one particular time in this region here and here is a mound on the sea floor, either a cone or a dome, and it stayed in the same place for a long period of time. This makes the structures look much more biological. That's music to calf's ears. I'm really pleased because I think they've come to more or less the same conclusion that Hans and I did, that um, it's extremely difficult to explain such complexity away by any other means than biogenicity. There are other explanations we still have to consider, uh, but forms like this little branching structure here, uh, it's very, very difficult to think of any other mechanism that can produce something as complex as that. But for Bill Schaff, there's always doubt, unless you find fossils of the original stromatolite building microbes. It essentially is uh, finding the smoking gun. Sure, it would be nice to have a stromatolite, but people will argue about that. Uh, they won't argue about uh, real cellular microscopic fossils. If you can prove that they really are organisms, then you've got it. You just have it right there. But near the top of the hill, Bill found evidence that he couldn't dispute. A sort of contour map of Kath's egg cartons in the valley below. If you look at this slab, this slab initially, now it's tilted up, but initially it was flat on the bottom of the sea. And over time, it has been tilted up into this position. The other thing that is really interesting here is that you do have little ones like this one and this one and this one and you got intermediate sized ones and you got big ones and what's interesting about that is that 
that's typical of life. And boy, that's neat, because this is uh, three, uh, approximately three and a half billion years ago. This is three quarters the age of the Earth. At the end of the day, a consensus had emerged. Calf's objects were probably built by living organisms. Bill summed it up. It would be extraordinarily difficult, it seems to me, to make up any sort of plausible story to say, to explain these away and to claim that they weren't biological. I just think it's really, really, really difficult to do so. So I, I'd vote biological. By golly, I certainly would. But just when things were looking so good, Kath's day of triumph was threatened. So I think there's a, a piece missing. I'm sure I remember the face being larger than that. But it seems to me there's a couple of fresh bits already gone from it. And I think over here, which is off the photo, there's a bit missing there. Kath had always feared fossil thieves. She'd even avoided disclosing this location when submitting her paper. But reviewers insisted. One of the peer reviewers, which happened to be uh, Bill Schopf, who's been on this trip, uh, said that the work was very good. But unfortunately, if they were not prepared to give the location of the site accurately, so other scientists could examine the area in context, then he was not prepared to recommend publication. But the cones were too precious to leave as unguarded prey. Sadly, fossil theft in northwestern Australia is a reality. Last year, detectives in Broome recovered a fossilized dinosaur footprint that had been hacked from coastal rocks. Protecting them is almost impossible in such remote locations. Whilst we are aware that fossils do get stolen from time to time, the difficulty is that we're not always aware where they're stolen from or uh, exactly uh, when they're stolen. So it may not come to our attention for some time after the, the fact. The alleged culprits are now before the courts. A reputable fossil dealer told Quantum that the footprint might bring $3,000 on the international market. He put the value of Kath's stromatolites at nearly $40,000. Back in the Pilbara, the formation appeared to be intact. But the geological survey team weren't about to give thieves a second chance. This was a gamble. Would the precious fossils be damaged beyond repair? The team photographed the stromatolites just in case something went drastically wrong. The photos will also help make a replica, which will be returned in place of the original fossils. Okay. A lot easier than I thought it was going to be because it looks as if this, this is so damp, it looks like the river's been up and the... Uh, materials loose. You know, I think we all have mixed feelings about removing the samples from this context, but on the other hand, we know too that they're likely to disappear, unfortunately, if, if, if they're not removed. I've been having nightmares for the last week about whether uh, we're going to be able to do this without yeah, that's gone. All right, that's sort of rock drills and hammers, and of course the risk's always whether it's going to smash up in the process, so I'm just so relieved that these are so loose, because we can just get them out. It's ironic that after three and a half billion years, these things that sat there not bothering anybody have had to be taken away just because in the last 10 years we've had some people that were too greedy. And as for Kath? She's pleased her reputation survived intact. Most of all, she's relieved that after three and a half billion years, her stromatolites are now safe and sound.